Hello, everybody, and welcome. I would like to start by saying that um, it has always been said that an inclusive programming approach means that barriers to inclusion of persons with disabilities should be removed and that they are empowered to participate fully in societal life, which includes um, when they're menstruating. Now, in regard to menstrual hygiene management, every woman and girl should be able to manage their monthly period safely, hygienically, and with dignity, specifically for women and girls with disabilities. And this afternoon, that is what we will be discussing. That's exactly what we'll be discussing to look at um, menstrual hygiene management. We're looking at menstrual hygiene management and perspective um, from females with disabilities. And I'm honored to have you all on this um, Zoom conversation. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Wendy Lai. I'm the founder of Inspire to Rise. And this was part of our conversations at our World Menstrual Hygiene Day, which was celebrated on May 28, 2020. So I'll start by introducing Nina Fedi Okara for she is um, the social worker with the Accra Rehab Center. I do have Anita Jando. She is the executive director Green. She is executive director Green Generation Ghana. She is also a gender and wash specialist. I also do have Alice Ose. She's a teacher. I also do have um, Jemima Ifwa York. She is a student, a JHS student with a demonstration school for the deaf. And then she is um, ably supported by her interpreter and teacher, Mr. Philip Gordon. Good afternoon to all of you and thanks for your time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everybody. Shortly we'll be joined by um, Dr. Tina Nami. She's also with the University of Ghana. We'll speak to her as and when she joins us. But let me start by asking um, everyone here that um, on May 28th, um, we, globally, we mark the World Menstrual Hygiene Day. Alice, um, were you aware of the day? What did you do on that day? I wasn't aware. It was oh. just recently when you said it before I got to know about it. Okay, how about yes. you, Nina? I had no idea there was such a day <laughs> wow. until you came around. <laughs> wow. Okay. And then, um, Jemima, were you aware of the World Menstrual Hygiene Day on May 28th? Mr. Gordon, we can't hear you. You have to speak up for us. He was not aware. She was also not aware. So all three yes. of you... Um, we're not aware of the World Menstrual Hygiene Day. Anita, you are a gender wash specialist. Um, ah, were you aware of the World Menstrual Hygiene Day and um, yes. what did you do on that day? Okay, so I'm aware of Menstrual Hygiene Day, um, okay. May 28th. Every year we celebrate my organization. We celebrate that day. This year we partnered with Renel Ghana and we did some door-to-door um, -door community awareness in... Mm -hmm. Um, in the Choco area. So we talked to about 100 girls in about 20 households and we distributed some products to them. So this is okay. what we do every year. Okay. Yeah. okay. As an add on to what Anita said, globally on May 28, uh, menstruators and individuals, stakeholders, associations, and people who are interested in the matter of menstruation and um, celebrate and mark that day globally with different activities. For us at Inspire to Rise, we did um, have a talk on what next after World Menstrual Hygiene Day. And thereafter, we've had another conversation, Zoom conversation on um, stigmatization and how to end stigmatization. And then we're having a third conversation now on disabilities and menstruation and how this affects um, females living with disability. So I would also want to find out from you um, what types of disability you have so that we can kickstart our conversation, Alice? Oh, okay. I'm a physically challenged. I have my left leg amputated. Okay. Yes. And then how about you, Nina? I'm visually impaired. I have residual vision from when I lost my sight at age 11. So I'm, I'm visually impaired. 
Okay, and how about you, Jemima? Is deaf. Mm. Okay. So, good afternoon, Dr. Tina Naami. She is um, Dr. Augustina Naami. She's a lecturer at the Department of Social Work, University of Ghana. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Good afternoon to you and your family and all your viewers. Okay. All right. So, we're, we're going to start this um, three conversation with our. Um, our main focus, we have um, Alice, we have Jemima, and then we have Nina, and then we'll have Anita and then Dr. Nami joining um, as and when they think they can make a contribution, but specific questions will be um, targeted at them and what they think and what they think should be done as well. Now, I would want to start with you, Alice, since you're the first person I can see. Now, <laughs> I, 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 on a personal note, at what age did you start menstruating and um, how did you deal with it? Oh, okay. Actually, I, by then I was 13 years. I was in my final year in junior high school. Okay. How about yes. you, Jemima? She started at age 10. She started at age 10. Okay. And then Nina? I was in class six. <laughs> okay, at what age then? Eleven. Eleven. So 13, yeah. 10, and 11. Okay, so Jemima, how did you feel? How did you deal with it, knowing that um, you're, you have a hearing impairment? How did you deal with it? One day she was asleep. She woke up and saw blood coming from her undies. Okay. Alice, how about you? Mm, one fateful morning. Yeah, I was already awoke. So all of a sudden I heard something like as if I want to read. So I went to check, but when I went it was blood. It was blood. Okay. And then yeah. how about you? Um Nina, um, uh, for me, I, I I think I was expecting it because everyone in my class <laughs> was getting it, mm. <laughs> and being the youngest in my class, I think mine was a bit delayed. So I was worried: when is mine going okay. to come? When is mine going to come? My only prayer was that when it did, I shouldn't it shouldn't come in front of the boys in the class. Mm. Okay, so, so my prayer was answered, and. It, Came at dawn, I woke up to go and see, and I saw it. And okay. even though initially I was scared, but I just knew what it was. Okay, so you then said I had sight. Then you you were sighted. Yes, then I was. Sighted. Okay, so you you didn't have a challenge of not seeing it, but um, so at what age did you um, have the visual impairment? I think less than a year after I had my nerves. Okay. I lost my sight. Less than a year after you had your message, you lost your sight. Now, um, is that to say that before you had it, you had prior knowledge? Because you said your friends had already, your schoolmates had already had their menses, so you were expecting it. So you already had some knowledge about menstruation. Absolutely. I, 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 I had prior knowledge. I had read books, discussed with friends, and, you know, you, know, you, you hear things from older people. Hmm. This is how it feels like when it, it comes and all that. So when it came, I was ready for it. All I didn't know what to do was how to put on the pad in my pantry. That my mom taught me. Okay. But I knew that having menses meant, yeah, I'm grown up. So I was waiting to grow up. Okay. How about you, um, <laughs> Jemima? Did you have any prior knowledge on menstruation and menstrual hygiene management? She didn't know anything about it. Oh, and um, and Nina says she had hers at home, right? So where yeah. was she in school or she was home? Yeah, 
In the home. In the home. So what did she do? When she saw the blood, she was afraid and didn't know what has happened to her. She ran to her mother. Although the mother did not explain anything to her. So she went to the father and told the father. The father was happy and asked her to go and take her bath. Okay. So is that to say that she didn't have prior knowledge on menstrual hygiene? Not, at, not, not at, at all. all. Not at all. So after she took her bath, what happened? After she has taken the bath, she went to the mother. The mother looked for a cloth and then uh, put it there for her. Okay. And did, well, did she receive any education on menstruation thereafter? Uh, no education really, but the mother cooked something for her to eat. We want to know what she, she ate. Okay. <laughs> the yam with egg. Okay. Eat. Okay. Um, but she I, didn't give any education about that. Okay. How about um, Alice? That's, um, Jemima has an interesting story there, but we'll move to Alice as well. Alice, what, yeah. how did you feel about it? What did you do? Mm, actually, I was not expecting it because I thought I was so young. By then, I was in my final year at junior high school, so I was actually staying with my aunties and the children, my cousins, but all of them had already grown. So <clears throat> when I woke up in the morning, I saw it. I told my auntie. Then she called one of the daughters to come. So when she came, they told me I should go and bath. So when I came back, I was even about to sit down when they said, hey, get up, you stand the chair. And I said, hey, what is this? So they asked me to bring my panty. So when I brought it, they placed the pad inside for me. They told me to wear it. Actually, it was a day for school. So we were all getting ready for school. They just said that we should go to school. So when we come back, I have to bath and do the same thing they have done for me today. I have to be repeating it hard. So the time I see that, it is no more day. So that was what the kind of education happened. they gave you. Yeah. That's to say that you used that single part through the process in school till you came home. Yes, that was all they gave me. Okay. And you didn't spoil yourself? No. Actually, okay. I don't bleed much. Okay. Okay. Now yeah. let me go back to Nina. Nina, so they've shared what they did. What exactly did you do? Okay, so I woke up at dawn. I saw this uh, new thing in my panty. I went to my big sister and I was like, Sister Gladys, this is what I have seen in my pants. Is it period? And she said, yes, it is period. I said, so what do I do? She said, okay, it, it will be morning soon. So just put some tissue there and in the morning, go and show it to your mother. So later in the morning, I went and told my mom, my period has come. She was like, do you know what it is? I said, yes, it means I'm a big girl. She was like, okay, I'm proud of you, you know it. So she gave me money to go and buy my first sanitary towel. Okay. It was always. <laughs> <laughs> I bought it, I brought it to her. She said, go and bring your pants. I brought it to her. She showed me how to put it on. And she gave me the whole bag, the whole pack of it and said that I should always have it on me. And anytime I felt wet, I could change it. So I remember that day, I, I didn't go with my school bag. I went with a nice small ladies bag just to show my friends that I have also arrived. <laughs> <laughs> because and I, 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 I quite remember, it. yes, I quite remember that day I changed more than five times. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, yeah. so you use a pad. Jemima used um, a cloth. What did you use, Alice? Yes, I also used pad. 
you also used pad. But before we yeah. even speak to Dr. Nami and then Anita, Jemima, so at what points did you start using a pad? She started using it when she was 11 years. Okay, but she started menstruating that at is age 10. Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Augustina Nami is a lecturer at the Department of Social Work um, with the University of Ghana, Legon. And I would also say that we're honored to have you here with your years of experience. You, you are also physically challenged. And looking at the narration given to us, um, the personal experiences shared by Jemima, Nina, and then Alice. They all said they didn't have any prior knowledge. Um, they, we spoke about World Menstrual Hygiene Day. They said they didn't know about World Menstrual Hygiene Day. We also touched on um, menses and when their menses started. Nina says she was expectant because all her classmates had started menstruating, but for Alice and then also Jemima looked as if they didn't have any prior knowledge on menstruation. What do you make of this? Um, thank you so much, Wendy, and um, all the panelists here. I greet you all. This is not surprising to me because most times persons with disabilities are not regarded, not even in the family. You know, because information about menstrual hygiene management is something that the girl child is supposed to know even before anything like that happens. You know, every female should be able to manage their menstrual period safely, hygienically, and with some form of dignity. But you just said what the panelists said. They have to go around talking to other people, finding out what is this, what is that, and so on and so forth. You know, so access to information on menstrual hygiene management is crucial. To Anita, Doc had earlier started a conversation on um, lack of education being the norm because we talk about menstruation, but we don't focus on females living with disabilities. What do you make of them? Um, I asked Doc the same question. I'm going to ask you, what do you make of the narrations given by Nina, Alice, and also Jemima? These are the ex personal experiences. It's not like we heard it from somewhere else and we're concocting stories, but they are with us and they've shared the experiences with us. Again, um, like Dr. Nami said, it's not surprising. Because even for um, girls who are abled, they have, you know, not all of them have access to information about menstruation before their first experience. So mm -hmm. it's not surprising at all. And um, beyond that, even for when the experience comes, what about the facilities that um, are supposed to be available for them to, to support their experience, like clean facilities in schools, toilet facilities, changing rooms, even the pads that is supposed, they are supposed to use. You know, I, I, one of the girls I talked to um, recently in one of my education with um, girls with disability, I realized that even the communication, especially girls with, um, who are um, hearing impaired, okay, how do they communicate mm. with their parents mm. about menstruation? And what, how do parents communicate to them? You know, remember that um, Jemima mentioned that her mother couldn't tell her anything. Okay, so then the communication is also a problem. Apart from the general information that is not available, parents are also not in a position to communicate adequately with their girls who are disabled in one way or the other. You know, and even our parents, what kind of information um, do they have about menstruation? Uh, information about menstruation is not something that you have 
even as it, it doesn't come with experience. You should know. You know, you I I have men menstruated for some time now, but I wouldn't say, you know, for a lot of women, when I'm doing this education, there are other women around, you see that they are also learning something, even though they've gone through that experience over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it is not enough to learn from your experience, but you have to have uh, enough adequate um, professional information mm -hmm. about menstruation and how to manage it. So it is not surprising that a lot of these girls go through this experience without knowing exactly what it is and how mm -hmm. to manage it. And in the school system where they're supposed to have some support system to help facilitate that process, that information is also not adequate. Mm -hmm. Jemima, how did you communicate to your dad? Did you have to use sign language or what did you tell him? How did you go about it? <laughs> She wrote it. Okay, so she wrote it down on a paper. Yes. Okay. So that's like um, exactly what Anita mentioned. The communication barrier and gap is a challenge. I would also want to find out, um, Alice, you have a, a physical disability. You're physically challenged. Yeah. How do you cope um, during the time of the month? <laughs> during school time, it was not easy at all. Because normally when I go to school, I'm always in class. It's only when I want to eat or maybe I want to urinate or go to the washroom before I'll leave the classroom. Because most of my friends, even when it is time for break, when you, they are playing and you want to go and join them, they'll be pushing you, your leg, do this. We don't want any problem. You'll fall down, go here. So I hardly mingle with them. So when I menstruate to their, uh -uh, then it becomes worse because I don't even want a situation whereby I will soil myself and they'll be talking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So that was my experience. Okay. So, um, so it's through this, if you want to change, for instance, what do you do? Do you have to talk to some of your classmates to help you? How do you go about no. it? No, no, I go myself. I manage. I go myself. I do most of the thing myself. Okay. Even during college, uh -uh. I don't want to put my burden on someone. Some people may come willingly to help. That one there is there. But for me to call somebody and the person will do something, uh -uh. I don't want the person to boo me and tear them, them, them. So I will not even call anybody. I do most everything myself. I manage. I mean, since I'm wearing artificial legs, sometimes I get sore on the leg. Mm. So maybe I can be at dorm almost a week without going for lectures. The teachers know. Yes. All right. Jemima, you're, you're also you're in school now. And... Um, how do you cope when you're menstruating? Sometimes when she's having a menstrual pain, she decides to <clears throat> stay in the dormitory for a while. Um, but when the pain is gone, she only has to go and change when necessary. Okay, so she doesn't really have difficulties being in school and menstruating. Yeah, school is in a boarding house, so they don't, she doesn't have that much problem okay. going to change. Okay. Now, Ani, you, Nina, you, you, you said you, when you started your menses, you were sighted. Did you have to reorient yourself? What did you do? How did you cope? Were you thought on what to do when you're menstruating, knowing that you had moved from being sighted to 
visually impaired? Um, well, okay, so becoming visually impaired now meant that I couldn't even see what I was doing. I could only move around by touch. And so I, I just had to pay more attention to my body to know that um, the time of the month has come and I, I need to be more vigilant. Sometimes, you know, you, you can't tell between your, the usual vaginal fluid or the blood mm. until someone tells you that, okay, I think you have stained yourself, so you need to. And that was in the very early days. But, you know, it gets to a point as you grow, you learn to expect, you know, to time it and know when it's coming. And then you can easily go and change. And it, it really affects, you know, the kind of dresses you wear during the time of the month and how you package it. And with my residual vision, I have to get so close to my panty to make, make it out. Okay, this has some color to it. Then it's blood. That kind of thing. So but if... if mm -hmm. You finish. Yeah, so that's how I, I sort of reoriented myself mm -hmm. to get to know my body better, pay more attention to the time of the month, and then make those distinctions. So once I see that it is coming, quickly wash down and then get the pad on. Okay, so as a stance, um, how would you know that you'll be menstruating tomorrow? What are the signs you look out for? Okay, so um, days leading up to, to the time of the month, there are changes. Um, the boobs, the, the breasts get a bit, it increases in size. Um, there's sometimes a slight pain in the back of my waist. Then I know that the time is getting closer. Okay. And so I'm on high alert. Okay. Okay. The only time I, I could soil myself is in the first two or three days of my flu. Okay. And um, so those first two, three days, it's a very heavy flu. Mm. And so it, it sort of informs what I wear. If I'm going, if I have to go out, I will prefer to be in heavy clothes like jeans, trousers, or a dark skirt, dark dress, dark colored, because I was thought that no one has to see my blood right from my, my childhood days. No one has to see my blood. So I would prefer to put on something dark colored. So that, I mean, they say if you don't see it, then it's not nasty. Mm. If I've stained mm. myself, it's already in a dark dress, so no one sees it. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that also leads to the myth surrounding menstruation, because we have still not come to understand that it's a normal phenomenon. And exactly. women go through it every time. Have you encountered stigmatization? And how did that make you feel? Yes, I have. And you see, the, the, the funny thing is that when you soil yourself, they don't see you as a woman who has just soiled herself. They see you as a blind person who doesn't know she has soiled herself. So they, they sort of like, oh, the blind girl has soiled herself. But what's the point here? No one has eyes behind them to know. So even, with, even if I had sight and I had soiled myself, it's possible that I wouldn't know. And how does that make you feel? very uncomfortable very very uncomfortable so that's why you, you 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 tend to be more extra careful you tend to keep wiping yourself keep changing your pad just in case just to be on a safer side better safe than sorry okay. yeah um alice how about you yeah it's me too normally when i'm in streets i always wear black always i always wear just to prevent people from yes because even without the menstruation when you are walking and somebody is walking towards you the moment the person bypasses you the person turn again to look at you just because maybe you are limping or something so you, you could imagine if you have also seen yourself so always i'm very 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 critical about it when i'm in street so in order to avoid any stigmatization and stuff, I just wear black whenever I'm in street. Jemima, tell us about your experience.
She's also saying that she normally uses the black, but when she's in school, that they're supposed to put on check, um, she tries to be as careful as she can. And the bit about stigmatization. What? The bit about stigmatization. He said once she was in school and she just had a message in a classroom and um, somebody saw it and they all laughed at her. Mm. How so did she it, feel? Hmm. She became so disappointed, especially those who were working at her were boys. And um, she, she, it happened once. And since then, she has been very, she has been very, very careful. Anita, you, you, you do a lot of education in this regard. And um, I'm sure we all once want to be in the shoes of Jemima, even at her age, you can imagine the emotional stresses and psychological stresses she'd be going through. Same for Alice and then Nina. And even for females who aren't um, disabled or living with disabilities, we also go through that. But for them, it comes across as if it's a special case because they are attacked as being suffering from one disability or the other. How do we deal with this? For, for the girls, what I tell them is that you, you have to understand your cycle. So if you are very much aware of your cycle, you know when it comes and when it's supposed to stop. So you are always prepared. So what I tell them, usually when I do this education, I give them a, a pouch I call dignity kit. It looks something like this. So I give it to them and I tell them that um, once you know your cycle, getting to the 28th day or thereabouts, you always have this handy in your bag mm. so that you stock it up with an extra panty, a pad, um, um, soap, sanitizer, um, paper, and rubber bag so that any time you realize that you are in your, your menses is coming and you're not um, wearing a pad, you just step out of the classroom or wherever you may mm. be to a mm. private place where you can change. So I give them this education and I tell them to, you know, to understand that these things would, you know, even for us, we also experience it. So just the understanding that you, you have to know your cycle and mm. prepare for it at every point mm. in time. Mm. I want to find out from you, Anita, the bit about me not knowing how to fix my pad and how do I go about it. You've shown us the dignity kit, kits that you have. Can you take us through how to properly fix your pad and dispose it of? Okay. So for, for a pad, you know, um, the average pad looks something like this. Mm. When it is wrapped, it looks something like this. I have um, various um, types here. It looks something like this. This is also another type. Okay. So an average pad looks something like this. So first of all, you need to know um, the parts of the pad because it has parts. It's not one long um, something. It has parts. So once you open it like this, okay, you realize that there's a long part and there's a, a short part and there are the wings on the side. So you have to know this. Then I also have a panty here which I use to demonstrate how to um, fix the pad. So looking at the pad and identifying the short part and the long part, you open up the short part. There's an adhesive at the back of the pad. So you pull it off halfway, this way, 
then you get your panty ready. Also, the pants has, you know, every an average pant will have um, a lining in the, in the middle part that goes to your vagina. So that lining has um, a seam in front and a seam at the back. So the front one comes to your vagina and the back part goes to your, your anal area. So the short bend of your pad, you, you fix it on the the uh, the lining or the seam that goes to your vagina okay so the way the pad is designed it will fit perfectly the lining that is created in your panty so you have that you fix it there the adhesive you know sticks to your panty then you pull the line the adhesive gradually you know before you do this you should have sanitized your hand you know, because you don't want to contaminate your, your pad or even contaminate yourself. So you would have sanitized your hand. So you would pull it off gradually until the back bend where the long um, part is fits on the back oh, yeah. of the line. And yeah. you fix it on, you fix it on, you know, until it's firmly fixed. And you don't throw away your, your, the, line, the, the wrapper. You don't throw it away because it will come in handy later. So you keep it in your dignity kit or wherever you, you, you keep your, your pad. So it is firmly fitted here. But then you also have to open up the wings and, and flip it around your panty to securely fix it. So again, you remove the adhesive on the wing. You move it halfway. Then you flip it back to hold on to your panty. Then you remove the other adhesive and you flip it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you realize that as I'm doing this, I've tried as much as possible not to be touching the surface of your pad. So as to not to contaminate yourself because, you know, even the sanitizer, they say it's 99%. And not 100%. So you have to be very careful with this. So once you've done this, your pad is firmly fitted into your panty and you can um, use it. And I'd always advise them that you do this before you take your bath. Because you, if you don't do it, you, you go to the bathroom, you come out and you, know, you are rushing to fix it and the thing is coming out. And, you know, it can be very embarrassing. So you fix it, you to put it together nicely, you put it down. So that when you come back from the bathroom, you can open it up and wear. Mm -hmm. So this is how it is fixed. And when you finish and you need to change, okay, once again, you, you take it off, you remove your panty, and you rip the salt part off the panty this way. Okay. Then once it's done, you, you put the edges together to get the stain part locked in so you don't have to touch it. Then you roll it up. You roll it up into a tight, you know, in a tight, you know, rolled up like this. Then you flip the wings over. You flip the wings over. So it's tightly sealed in this way. Then you take the, the wrapper. Then you again, you fold it in and you roll it. You roll it up this way. And if that adhesive on the uh, pad is still working, you can you know, tightly fit it together this way. But this is not enough. Okay, it's not enough because eventually the adhesive would come off. So you have to find a better way. Okay, we can't of, see you now. Yes, yeah, so the adhesive will usually come off after some time. So what you do is that you take a, an old paper, an old newspaper or any product that. Any paper Anissa, that we can't see your video. Okay. 
Okay. okay. So All you right. have this and you need to wrap it up again because this is not secure. Mm -hmm. My video is off again. Yeah. Okay. So you have this paper, something like this, just an old newspaper mm -hmm. or a paper out of your exercise book. Then you put the pad wrapped this way into the paper. Then you roll it up. You roll it all the way. When you are about three quarters through the paper, when you're about three quarters through, you stop and you flip the wings together this way. Okay, so once you've done this, you roll the excess edge. You roll it up this way and you realize that there's a pouch created at the area that you flip the edges together. There's a pouch that is created and you push the excess edge into that pouch mm. like this. So now the pad is firmly tied into this paper. You can drop it anywhere and it would not open. Okay, even dogs may not know what this is because it's, you know, you've wrapped it in rubber and you've wrapped it in this again. So this is how to secure your pad and ensure that you dispose of it um, adequately, properly, without... Um, so why, why, um, why can we dispose of it? Because you said so, anyway, initially, and if someone hears anywhere, they might think that, oh, okay, I could just leave so, it on the point or somewhere. <laughs> so, well, even now, it, um, you know, people would burn, others would bury. But I would say that um, just add it to your regular waste and let it be picked up and disposed of. Mm. You know, or if you have to dump it wherever, um, you know, you have to do it properly. So you, um, where you dump your regular waste, that, that would be the, the best. Way. Because burning is not recommended and burying is not recommended as well because mm. it's not, you have plastic lining and it's not biodegradable. Mm. So you don't burn or you don't um, bury. So you add it to your regular waste and it is picked up and the professionals will deal with it. <laughs> okay. Doc, um, initially we spoke about um, staining oneself in stigmatization and we had the experiences okay. of all three um, ladies. As a social worker, yeah. um, what, what, what's your take on this and how do we deal with this? Okay. Thank you so much. Most times, when it comes to issues of persons with disabilities, even within the family, we have a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues even within the family and then outside of the family. You heard them all say that they did not get any meaningful information before it happened. And even when it happened, the information that they received was kind of scanty. And I said earlier on that this is not surprising mm. to me. Research shows that Females with disabilities are less likely to have information, you know, accessible information, information that they can understand when it comes to menstrual hygiene, management, and many other aspects of their lives. And the same research also shows that women or females with disabilities are more likely to have premenstrual syndrome, so mood and behavior, you know, changes, before menstruation. And research also research shows that they are more likely to have what in the literature is called menorrhagia, and that means heavy flows. And I think you heard them talk about all of this. So that is a more reason why they need to know more about all of this information about how to manage their menstruation, information about how to manage the pain, if there's any pain at all, and so on and so forth. But what we see is that, yes, yeah, the information is not available. The information that is available is also not accessible. It's not accessible to them at all. So um, probably we need to get information that is accessible, information that they can understand they can understand so that it will be useful to them. So for instance, those who have uh, visual, visual, visual disability, information in the form of audio materials will be useful or braille will be useful for them. Those who have hearing impairment, 
information in the form of audiovisuals, read, sound language interpretation will be useful for them. One group or category of females with disabilities that sometimes we do not even think about or consider are those who have intellectual disabilities. Mm. When it comes to um, menstrual hygiene management, less, less attention is paid to them. It's like, oh, uh, their health, their caregivers will help them, you know, but we had, we all know that issues about menstruation and not comfortable issues that anyone wants to share with anybody. You know, the females should be able to manage uh, their menstruation with dignity, you know, so that they don't have many people interfering into um, how they do it or how they're not doing it and so on and so forth. So with females who have intellectual disabilities, because of the low um, cognition and the rate at which information is absorbed, it's important that we take time to let them understand issues around menstrual hygiene management. So for them, um, menstrual hygiene management information mostly should be in visual, uh, vi visual materials because they understand uh, images much better than text. And then we should practically help them understand what does it mean if you have a stain on your cloth? Um, when do you change or when do you have to change a pad? How do you change a pad? How do you dispose of a pad? We need to take time to teach uh, these individuals how to manage all of this. And we all know that when it comes to um, interventions, programs, most times we do not consider persons with disabilities. Nina? We, we've said a yes. lot, uh, we've had um, an eye-opening conversation this afternoon, but I would want to find out from you, Doc was um, touching on interventions and what we need to do, what stakeholders need to do, what governments need to do. Um, from your personal point of view, what would you want to see done to support um, females living with disability? Um, in my opinion, and, and as is the, the norm, as we always say, charity begins at home. And so I would suggest that interventions must start from the home. It is when our parents, especially the female figures in the home, like in my case, my mom and my elder sister, when they themselves know what to do, they will be able to help the children go through that phase of their life because not everyone you know gets to that point and having your first menstruation is a big deal for a young girl and so having someone who knows what to do at that point to encourage and educate from that point i think is is is, is very important okay so from the, the my the very first intervention i will push out for is for the female figures in the home to take up the mandate of educating the girls even before they start. Because for me, from age 11, I started to know about, and I was expecting it from age 10 because of the friends around me and from school. So I was being taught and my mom bought books for me and I was reading. I had pictures of the uterus and I could see the two hand-like thing holding the ovaries. So I, I knew what to expect. And that's what I think helped prepare me a bit for it, even outside the disability bit. It was okay. becoming disabled that now have to maneuver through that phase. Mm. And so I think that's the first thing that should be done. Okay. And then that, that should also translate into always ensuring that there is constant supply of sanitary material, not just the pad. But there should also always be running water, there should be tissues, anything that could help a lady go through that three, four, five, six, seven days of the month successfully and without having any a, a, a mental breakdown because they stain themselves and boys were laughing at them. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Alice, 
Most of the young ones, they start menstruating during school time. We spend most time too in the school. We we must have a restroom where we can change our path, where we can wash our hands as well. And also, just as you have been doing, visiting schools, donating parts. Me, for instance, my parents are not all that well doing. They are both farmers. So I don't think maybe it's always that they can buy the pad or something. As I was growing up, I've used this cloth. I've used cloth. It got to a time that there was no money to buy pads. So I had to use the cloth just to save myself. So governments can also come in, at least donate pads to the school children, the, the girls to use. So that it doesn't prevent them from not going to school. Someone will say, oh, I have my menstruation, but I don't have pads. So today, I will not go to school for almost all the seven days. I will wait till maybe it stops before I go. So if government can come in, at least donate pads to girls with disability, I think it will also help us a lot. Okay. All right. Jemima. She's saying that um, if um, parts could be, sanitary parts could be given to them on timely basis. And two, if um, some sort of workshop can be organized for the girl, child, and their mothers, so that whatever their children are being taught, the mothers will also be aware. But in the home or in the school, they will not lack information. Okay. Then she's saying that uh, the schools should also teach them um, about menstrual hygiene. It should be something the school should teach. All right. Okay, so uh, Dr. Nami and Anita, we've seen um, specific uh, repetitions uh, of this conversation related to access to sanitary parts the cost of sanitary parts in education. Anita, briefly, what do we do? Okay, so the cost of sanitary parts has always been an issue. Um, we know now that there's a tax component on the sanitary part that is causing the cost to be that way. Um, so we, the advocacy has been that government should take a look at this and scrap it as much mm -hmm. as possible. It should be, sanitary parts should be one of the things that schools should be supplied with as part of the... Um, um, sanitation facilities in school. So water, um, adequate changing rooms, um, stuff with all the products, soap, um, and sanitary pads should be one of the things that are available in schools for girls to use. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also mentioned the facilities that are needed. Education is important. Now, the education that happens in the school is very scanty and sketchy, and it is restricted within a curricula, and you know how it is. You only learn to write an exam and you pass. You know, you don't actually practicalize it. And the teachers that teach it may not be, um, you know, adequately um, informed about, you know, some of these issues. So we have to take a look again at how um, menstrual hygiene issues are taught in school, how social and productive health issues are taught in school. Some schools have done, go, gone ahead to establish clubs, girls' clubs. And um, those clubs have been the avenue through which some of these information are shared with the girls. So it is very important that we continue in that direction. But not all schools have these um, information and facilities. And our parents, you know, uh, you know Nina mentioned it very well, the, the female figures in our homes, those who are expected to teach us and give us those information, they themselves may not be adequately informed. And like um, uh, Jemima said, you know, the education should be both ways. So for uh, girls with disabilities, especially those with hearing impairments, you know, their parents should be involved in this education because so that they know that um, this is what the girls expect as part of um, managing the, mm. uh, their menstruation and dignity so that the parents can meet up and, and help them accommodate and take care of this experience. 
Right, Dr. So, and the, and mm. issue, finally, the issue of um, um, menstrual hygiene being a taboo issue and the fact that boys stigmatize, they tease girls, you know, that thing should be done away with. It's, it's, it, you know, it's still overdue. You know, it's a natural thing and every girl should be, there should be no stigma, there should be no taboo around it and every girl should feel it be able to talk about it without any fear. And it all boils down to education. That's why we're having um, this Zoom conversation. So when it goes out, there a lot more can hear and be informed. Doc, I have two minutes. Right. Um, for your final yes. words. Yes. So I will say that um, the infrastructure has to be accessible for persons with disabilities. And we need to ensure that this happens in schools and not just in schools, um, in communities, wherever. Because um, most times you heard uh, the ladies talk about their experiences, you know, about heavy flow. And I talked about how research indicates that this is the case that about six, persons with disabilities are about 6% higher and uh, having heavy flow and so on and so forth. So access to infrastructure facilities for hygiene should be accessible for persons with disabilities. Um, when you take uh, our, our washrooms, for instance, uh, sometimes what we see is that we are told that they are made accessible because they are ramps, but are the ramps usable? A person mm. in a wheelchair, let's say the person in a wheelchair is even able to wheel themselves to the, uh, the washrooms. You know, most times our doors open to the inside. So if the door opens to the inside and the room is not spacious enough, turning around space is not there. So the person is in there, they can't close the door behind them. So all of these are issues. Where is the privacy? How are they comfortable to manage all of this? So these are issues that we really need to focus on the facilities for maintaining hygiene, uh, hygiene, hygiene, menstrual periods, should be made accessible to all persons with disabilities. And every information regarding menstrual hygiene management should include persons with disabilities because they are expert knowers of their issues and they can best help us figure out the way that we can help them. That would be more meaningful um, to them. I heard the ladies talk about um, the issue of having access to uh, the, the menstrual... Yes, not just that, well, every, every material that, that they will need for that. Research shows that females with disabilities are more likely to be represented among the poor. They are more likely to be poor because of the intersection of gender and disability. Gender and disability interact with create several vulnerabilities for them. So, yes, it's very important that we begin to think about how do we address okay. their issues our attitudes towards persons with disabilities. This is very important. We can mm -hmm. have policies upon policies, but if we don't begin to change the way we perceive persons, persons with disabilities, the policies and the laws may uh, lead us to nowhere. But okay. our attitudes are also very important. Attitudes towards persons with disabilities, yeah. Okay, so on that note, I would want to say a very big thank you. And we must always, always remember that um, Females, whether living with a disability or not, we should be able to manage our menstruation safely, hygienically, and with dignity. And I'm sure that with the concerns raised by our panelists, the various stakeholders, when they have access to um, this Zoom conversation, will learn a thing or two to improve the lives of all females, but also specifically that of females living with disability.